Greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today, and thank you for joining me on today's first half. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. The merch is displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They all were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. Finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click that like button. It takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things, they really do help this channel to continue to grow and go. And folks, they definitely matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with today's upload, shall we? All right, so last night's second half was the first interview I ever did with Robert Sharp, the owner of Rascal. He is a subscriber to the channel. Um, has participated in every live stream we've had. Just a really decent guy. I'm going to be narrating his uh, Hellhound encounter or Demon Dog encounter very soon. Um, but a lot of you enjoyed it. And a lot of you have asked about Robert and Rascal. So that's why I was like, I've got so many new subs. I've got to share this again because it's about a year and a half ago. And a lot of you loved last night's uh, first interview, and it was the first interview. So this is the second interview that I ever did with Robert Sharp. Um, I'm taking advantage of the situation that I am going through, my family and I, um, to reshare these as well. I need some time. Um... I need some time. I need to take a couple days off. So I figured, hey, why not just reshare the great interviews that Robert did with us about a year and a half ago so you guys can hear the entire story that he shared with us. Um, my, as many of you know, I was diagnosed with a terminal illness, uh, PNH, and my doctor... After some blood work last month, um, it's kind of resurfaced. It's, it's starting to show its signs again. I am going to have surgery on my leg Wednesday. Uh, there's a lump of some sort by the, my bone in my leg, in my right leg, and my doctor wants it biopsied. Um, but... Also, my dad has been very sick for the last year and a half fighting his own battle. And he, at 11 o'clock today, is going in for um, another vascular surgery. So I need a couple of days. And uh, I'm, I figured I'm going to take this time to be with my mom today and share this these two interviews, because there's going to be two about Robert today, and then two tomorrow, because he did five in total. So I hope that you guys understand, and uh, I do appreciate it. So let's get into this second interview with Robert Sharp. Tonight's second half will be the third interview. Tomorrow's first will be the fourth, and tomorrow's second half will be the fifth. So, and also they are a re-upload, which I did say last night, and apparently people didn't hear it because they asked the question, um, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get into it. All right, everybody. Tonight, like we said, we will have a part two with Robert, 
Robert is the gentleman who raised a dog man from a pup to a full grown. His name was Rascal. And Robert, how are you this evening? I'm doing really good this evening. I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me, and I'm, I'm really excited about part two of this. Um, I'd like to kind of make a statement. Uh, in one of the comments I'd read, um, someone said, you know, I can hear uh, pages being turned. And I believe I did say it in the initial interview that you had been interviewed prior to, and you had left out a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. You had written a book about your life with Rascal. You're still working on it. Um, and you're using that as kind of an outline for this interview. Uh, yeah. That's, that is the pages being turned. He's, he's kind of going through the outline and sharing, you know, what, what he left out and what he didn't leave out. He just wants to get the story out incomplete. So, with that being said, I'm going to turn the mic over to you, and you can start off where I guess we left off at. Yeah, where my first camping incident started. Okay. Okay, well, my, hello, everybody. Well, my first camping incident, well, this, this first camping incident started, really hit right at the summer of 1990 when I had my... Uh, truck parked in one of my grandfather's cornfields. The corn was only half grown at the time because we were late in planting all that corn that year. It had just gotten dark about 8.30. Rascal and I were laying in the back of my truck. The, it was a moonlit night with lots of stars. And about and it was only 75 to 80 degrees. It was kind of mild. We both fell asleep. And everything was around us, including the woods, off to our left, went real quick, absolutely quiet. About 15, 20 minutes while we were just laying there, I kept hearing a ping, ping, ping along the side of my truck like someone was throwing pebbles or small rocks. And then all of a sudden, a small rock hit Rascal dead square in the nose. He immediately got up from the back of the truck. Bipedal, he was growling and snarling. I got up. I looked up to my right where the woods were, and they're standing no more than 20, 20 25 foot from us in the cornfield with these, was a, Two juvenile type four Bigfoot and a young dogwai. Now, off in the far edge of the woods, where the fence line was, was their huge, was their big ugly leader, a uh, nine foot alpha male with gray hair on both sides of his face. And he was, he was, he must have been an older one, but he was still in charge of his uh, Bigfoot pod. He. Apparently, he saw our truck, and he sent these three juveniles to investigate. And as Rascal stood up and snarled and growled at these juveniles, the, the skinny juvenile, Gogwai, slid under my truck. I guess to count coup on us or whatever. Well, Rascal saw this. He grabs that thing on the right side of my truck. He reached down there grabbed that gargoyle by the head and he viciously face punches this gargoyle several times and the jackhammer punches caving his face in. Well, this, uh, this damn gargoyle is trying to get away, trying to push himself out from under the truck when Rascal's got a hold of him. Well, his two buddies, his two companions quickly grabbed hold of each of his foot and dragged him out from under him, which slipped which slipped uh, Rascal's grip on him. And Rascal quickly jumped up out of the truck, back of the truck, while they were dragging their companion, their gargoy companion off. Rascal got behind them and was giving them warning barks and everything else to run them off. When uh, Juveniles and their leader left, 
Rascal came back. We immediately went home. I told my grandfather about what happened. He told me the old Bigfoot was sending these young ones out to scout and expand their territory. And he also told me there's a bunch of our neighbors were talking to him saying they were missing their pet dogs and cats that week. Mm -hmm. So he reminded me and Rascal, we've got to be more careful. Because, you know, you never know what these dang things are going to do. Right. You really don't. Because that kind of went the night for us right then there. <laughs> I was not happy. Yeah, yeah. They just took off their with their, their leader. They just ran. Yeah, out of yeah. There. Yeah, that damn thing just sent them juveniles out there, I guess, to test us. Okay. That's what I'm guessing. Can, can you kind of explain what they look like? Okay, this dog way. Yeah, what is what, well, really, never, what is a dog way? What are you referring to? Uh, right? Here's a uh, dog way. What I refer to is kind of like a Bigfoot. Now, these things are real thin. Yeah. Some of them are. And they got a baboon face. But they're so inbred. I've noticed... They sometimes have ears within the ears. My my grandpa sometimes called him a fake big Bigfoot before ears or a fake dog man. Okay. Because they got this protruding, protruding kind of snout, but it's more like a baboon face to me. Okay. And when they have, when, when my grandfather says they have four ears, they got two big ones, but they got two smaller ears inside the big ones, which kind of freaks me out real bad because I'm thinking, I asked my grandfather, is this due to their inbred? They're real bad inbreeding or something? Yeah. He says it could be. Hmm. Because it's one, this alpha Bigfoot, he kind of like had, had the cone head, but he had the real, real black eyes. When he opened up his mouth and I saw his teeth, they were kind of like jagged and square. Okay. Kind of kind of yellowish red. Hmm. And those others were exactly like it, but when that guard way, when his face when i saw a rascal cave in his face and i saw his mouth he he had he didn't have the square teeth he had sort of stunted kind of round teeth like they were like misshapen teeth or something was wrong right well there's certainly some, something was wrong when rascal was punching his face in Now, so you guys got out of there. Yeah. And you talked to your granddad and dad. Or yeah. Like, and then, the, now was there, how old were you about this time? Let's see. I'm going, see, 1990. 22. Okay. So after that, you, you really didn't see any more of these creatures like a couple days after or was that kind no, of No, no, I didn't see them. Right I didn't see them until on my next uh uh to my next uh camping experience. Okay. All right. And this is with just me and Rascal and my girlfriend. Okay. Well, I'll let you finish how you how you planned on it. Sorry about I didn't mean to bother you and ask you. Or no, that's okay. That's okay. I just wanted to know what what these things uh, the explanation of what these things were. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the next incident was in the real late summer of uh, 1990, same year when uh. Me and my girlfriend and Rascal, we've been fishing in both of the big ponds that weekend. And we said, well, we're going to go ahead and uh, camp here for the weekend. 
And this is the place where me and Rascal love to uh, deer hunt. We uh, had the truck packed up, uh, parked up against our favorite oak tree and all that. We uh, just, we uh, fixed up three campfires and one cooking fire. We caught a whole lot of catfish, bass and bluegill and all that. We had an excellent meal and we turned in. Me and my girlfriend, we were sleeping deeply with Frasco laying right beside us. He was on guard about 11 to 11 p.m. that night, which is a Saturday night. An eight foot type four Bigfoot. This sucker was completely black. He was real, he was kind of real thin. He had a huge head and real strange about this Bigfoot. He hit one head, he had a right eye, his right eye was red, but his left eye was black. His face looked like, you know, a Neanderthal with Down syndrome. Okay. And. He had four-fingered hands. Now, one one of his hands had a. Well, there was only three. It's like so. He must have lost. I don't know how he lost it, or maybe his hand was misshapen that way. I don't know. And like I said, it was about eleven o'clock that night. This thing came came by. And he would, he, we can hear something walking all the way around our camp. And of course, I'm, and of course, my girlfriend, she had the uh, tent door open because she wanted some extra air. Well, this thing stuck his, poked his huge head in the doorway of our tent. <laughs> when Rascal saw this, he face punched him about five or six times with rapid, hard punches. And pushed his head back out the, back out the tent, punching him as he went. And uh, him and a Bigfoot were snarling, growling, and howling. And the fight lasted only two, three minutes, which Rascal literally beat that creature to death. So I mean, he killed him. Yeah, he killed him. Okay. And Rascal had punched his claw fist to the Bigfoot's head. Me and me and my girlfriend, we we immediately broke camp that night. We threw all our camp gear and everything in the tent in the back of the truck, and we left. We left, leaving that darn Bigfoot next to one of the campfires that we put out. Later that morning, we came back to our campsite with Dad and Grandpa, and the dead Bigfoot was gone. Hmm. My gra- and my grandpa said one of its companions came out and got him because he saw drag marks that went all the way down the creek. So I'd imagine it, it dragged it back to the or back, dragged it down the creek back to the woods. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, Real quick, how how big was this? Was this Bigfoot bigger than Rascal at the time, or no? Uh, no. No. Okay. It was about eight. It look. It was. It was just. I can't say it was as muscular, because these type four Bigfoot were always kind of real thin. Okay. And they always kind of had flat faces, and they're usually like flat, round faces. And their teeth were either are either depending mm-hmm. on how much inbred they are. Their teeth were will either be square or kind of tapered like a shark's. Okay. And the faces are always to me it looks always look real real round. And their their bodies just look. Now the bodies are lean and muscular, but they're just like they're not. If you've uh, ever seen pictures drawn of type one and type two Bigfoot, and it's like these type fours are just skinny. 
So, and they're very, and they're very, of all the Bigfoot, they're the most vicious. Okay. And they're the ones that, you know, because you, like you said prior, your home growing up was just right around the LBL. And yeah, these I are grew the up ones, around the LBL. These are the ones that were around the LBL. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, we had a few type one, type twos, but these type fours, everybody calls a skunk ape. Okay. Now, this uh, next uh, incident was a very, very scary one. This was in the uh, late fall. I was, uh, this is where I'm, and this was in 1991, I, when the first meeting with uh, these creatures called deer spirits. Okay. And... That this was a cryptid that really creeped me out. And at first of all, we didn't hear this thing. We didn't see this thing for two nights because we were uh, camping all weekend. We didn't hear it. We didn't see it, but we heard it all night long. I mean, this this thing was really scary. Okay. I was, I went to the far, because we, me and Rascal, we went to the far side of our homestead to cut firewood for that winter. And Rascal, we set up camp at early Thursday morning. We had breakfast. Then I cut down two small trees for firewood. The woods were real quiet, which made me feel uneasy. And thank God Rascal was only 30 foot away between me and the woods protecting me. After cutting all that wood up with my chainsaw, I split the wood with my axe and I load about 10 cords in the back of my truck. It's about 3 p.m. When I when I was a dog on woods looking at me, uh, and it was standing upright. It had that had a deer's head. It had red eyes and four fingered hands and hooves for for uh the front end looked like a hoof back end looked like a big foot foot and it was about seven foot tall it looked around about 400 pounds and it was just just standing there staring at me and it looked like it grinned at me at that time rascal walked up from behind me walked past me Look straight at the deer, uh, deer spirit and gave a warning bark. His claws were out, and man, he was mad enough. He meant business. The deer spirit saw him. It turned around and ran off bipedal. And it was, and uh, I never saw that thing again. The th and the strange thing I'm saying of this creature was its skin was brown. But it didn't have no hair on it like a deer or nothing. It was kind of like this brown, dark brown skin with a deer's head and antlers. And had these real, real long four-fingered hands. And the strange-looking hoof foot that I've ever seen. And arrested it, and and that night we went to I, I went in our tent. I really couldn't sleep. I just pressed myself up against Rascal all night long because I felt we were being watched. Okay. The campfires were kept bright and everything, keeping everything away from us. And we heard strange call noises and moans throughout the night, which just creeped me out. Rascal didn't sleep all night long. He just kept guard all night long until I fell into an uncomfortable sleep. And later that morning, about 7 a.m., we broke camp. I put out all the fires, and we left for home. When I got home, I told Grandpa, 
And here's what he said. He said, these are demons, demon spirits that were on the move like they do in the late spring and late fall. But he never told me why they did. I mean, that was just eerie. Yeah, I can imagine. I can really imagine. Yeah. <clears throat> and now, but they weren't, I mean, because you had said to me that you had uh, an experience with a goat man. These did not look like a goat man at all, I'm assuming, right? No. Okay. See, this this is a deer spirit. This is different from a goat man. Right. Well, I'm asking because this is these are names that I, I normally we I don't hear. I've never heard of prior to. Yeah. That. So I'm, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this uh, next experience is actually the first night hunt in the uh, late fall of 1991 when Rascal and I were in back of the family home said and we were along the border of the LDL close to the three ground caves okay. Rascal and I had gotten three good sized deer along the tree lines as we dress the deer out and bury the guts in the skins put the uh, meat in four huge cooler type containers in the back seat of my truck and locked it me and Rascal climbed up about 40 f foot about 40 feet in uh went up 40 feet in the tree where our deer stand was and we were waiting for another deer the moon the moon was out and what was eerie we could see everything on the ground it was 9 p.m when i closed my eyes and i had my mini 14 across my lap leaning against rascal with his strong arms and claw hands around me keeping me warm he was watching and listening for anything that may come near us including other predators Right. Now, I heard someone walking near us, and then I heard Rascal growl and snarl. I looked down at the base of our tree. There was this white, gray, fur-faced, red-eyed, type 2 Bigfoot climbing up our tree. Rascal quickly turned, put me up on the other side of the tree trunk of him, and he viciously face punches this Bigfoot several times with uh, heavy hits with it, with his metal razors that was folded around his fist like brass knuckles. The Bigfoot fell out of a tree with Rascal following him down, and Rascal killed him instantly when he slammed his uh, head in the ground. Rascal and I then got into our truck and it was about 11 p.m we we immediately headed home and in the morning i told my grandpa and dad so we went where where me and rascal was that night and the bigfoot's dead body was gone dad and grandpa said another one probably dragged it off dragged it off for food right because that night when me and rascal was going home was getting in the truck on the way home we could hear whooping sounds pretty close so i don't to you so or... i don't know if this creature had uh, i'm i'm assuming this thing had uh friends with it yeah yeah now were those whooping sounds close blah, close by or were they off in the distance they were off in the distance okay okay next incident Let's see if I can get to the dog on. Goat man, because that was really creepy. Yeah. This was in... This was actually just before the house attack. This was in... Uh, I'm still... It might have been 1991 in the uh, 
late summer, no, in, my, in, in the early spring, or the very, very early summer, because we had, we had, no, this had been, uh, this hadn't been, no, this is where, uh, it was late summer, we were picking, Rasco and I were out there in the uh, cornfields, and we were picking white corn. Well, it had gotten dusk, and we were feeling pretty good. We didn't hear nothing, and so we, so we just, you know, with two, he had a duffel bag. He was carrying the duffel bags, and I was filling them up. We got had two huge duffel bags of corn. Well, as we started walking back towards the house. I kept hearing footsteps behind us, and Rascal kept turning around, turning around, turning around, looking. At one time, his eyes got red. Then they went back to being yellow, and I said, okay, we're being followed. And Grandpa would have been playing jokes on us all that week. So I assumed that was him and Dad out here with us, kind of playing jokes. I said, Rascal, they're playing jokes on us. Let's turn around and head back the other way, the way we came. And that's what we did. We came all the way around that cornfield, that uh, main cornfield. And he, uh, this time when we got back up that hill, to the edge of that cornfield, we was up there walking along the fence line. Out come out this seven, eight foot tall goat man. Okay. Now what this thing looked like, it had yellowish brown fur. But if anyone knows Greek mythology, it looked like a satyr. Right. With a long goat face and black eyes now the thing with this goat man it looked like it already been into a fire because it had one of its uh horns it's a uh, left side horn was broken broken off okay well this thing turned around saw us and it charged at us and Rascal charged it when it thing when that thing jumped up in the air. Rascal jumped up in the air and met it half uh, met it met it halfway through the air. He stabbed it with his uh, <clears throat> claws and his metal razors and killing it instantly. And of course, we dropped our uh, corn and we headed back to the house as quick as we could. That next morning, we went and we went and got that, and when we told Dad and Grandpa that night, just as soon as we got home that morning, we uh, we went out there, at, and that thing's body was gone, and we have no idea what happened to it because I knew Rascal killed it. So we grabbed our uh, duffel bags of corn and we went back to the house because we saw where there was drag marks through the uh, cornfields back and through the woods. We don't know who dragged it off, so I can only speculate either one of its friends or maybe a Bigfoot dragged it off. Right. And that was the that was the goat man. That was the one time yeah. that. Now yeah. I've got a question, and I'm not, and don't take it the wrong way, um, please. Now, to me, it sounds like you know, Rascal is this you know dominant, unbeatable creature. Yeah, you know, are you? Yeah, sort of like yeah. It kind of sounds you know like he's 
like no other creature in the woods could beat him. I mean, is that, did he ever meet a, his match? Did anything, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's, it sounds one sided, you know, that's. Yeah. Oh, and that I understand is like, well, I'm attributing that. I mean, like I said, don't, I'm not take it, don't take it the wrong way. I'm just No, asking. no, no, I'm not. I'm, here's the way I can explain that. Because when we were training him and stuff, and he was getting stronger and stronger and stronger, we were noticing he was becoming an alpha male. And my grandfather says these alpha males, they'll keep getting stronger and stronger. Okay. I said, will this be until something else stronger beats him? And my grandfather says, yep. Yeah. Okay. And I think what else made Rasko a whole lot stronger, because we made sure he was, my girlfriend and my sister always made sure that uh, they actually kept up with his shots and stuff. And what my girlfriend told me and my sister told me this too the reason why rascal gets stronger and stronger is because of the vitamins that they give him when mm -hmm. they give him the shots and the uh yeah and the antibiotics okay because they said that attribute that a lot yeah. yeah they said plus rascal has a purpose, which which means you know protecting us, being part of the family, you know that and the love we give him, and they said, love can give you strength, like like you like almost superhuman strength, right? And plus, we we kept his health up real good. He had a real good diet and everything. Yeah, that, and those yeah, metal yeah. razors that Grandpa gave him, we, I'm gonna tell you right now that that's what gave him the most advantage. Okay, right there. That's what gave him the most advantage, that made him almost invincible. Okay. Yeah, that and like you said, a diet, a diet as a whole, you know, that's a that's a big thing. Yeah, you don't it is a big to, thing. You don't have to, you know. He he's getting food that yeah normally he wouldn't get or right you know see he's getting nutrition the stuff that a wild dogman or any of the other wild cryptid wouldn't right plus if he ever gets and he's been wounded several times and we see he the advantage for him is he's got us to uh, get him back to health. Yeah, and antibiotics and stuff that that out there in the, out there in the woods, if a cryptid something gets bad and badly wounded and bleeding, look, he's gonna get infected. He's gonna eventually die. Yep, yep, yep. Well, that 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 was just you know like he's he you know he like you said he's got the antibiotics, he's got vitamins. Yeah. Plus he's he you know obviously you're saying he he's training and this and that. Yeah, um, but he's he's eating daily, you know, where he yeah. doesn't have yeah. to go and and waste energy hunting. He he yeah. automatically has it right there. Yeah, that is ready. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just kind of wanted to, you know, bring that you know out because yeah. yeah, I didn't want people in the comment section being like, hey, you know, and but you did say he'd been hurt before so yes know. okay all right i didn't mean to interrupt you uh, that's okay uh well this next encounter is going to take a while for this one is this actually gives me kind of nightmares still Okay. This this came in. 
this came in 1990, and I'm going to have to say, yeah, spring of 1992, when I was on a three-week vacation. Okay. Uh, at my inventory job. It started on a Monday morning when I was drinking coffee with Dad and Grandpa, and my stepmom was in the kitchen cooking breakfast and my sister and my girlfriend well no know actually my sis my sister was sitting in the living room watching the news my school was laying beside me napping when my girlfriend amanda came over with her daughter sally amanda came over to us and told us little sally couldn't sleep because there's a monkey man looking at her through her bedroom window for the past three or four nights. Little Sally was crying at the time, and she just bolted over the rascal and wrapped her little arms around rascal's huge neck, causing him to cough. I kind of looked at Dad and Grandpa, and they both looked at, in turn, looked at me, and they looked looked at uh, Amanda. Then I quickly had rascal pick up little Sally, who was Amanda's da uh, adopted daughter from her first boyfriend who died in a car accident. And mm -hmm. Rascal took her over and took her and laid her down on the couch with uh, my sister. And he laid with her until she fell asleep. I, I, I got my Mini 14 with uh, two 20 round clips. I had Rascal get up get up with uh get up with uh, dad and grandpa and i had uh my sister and my stepmom stay with amanda and sally <sighs> my dad and grandpa they had their uh 50 caliber handguns with them and they followed me and rascal as we walked through the woods to uh, amanda's house which was a thin trail now that area between mine of uh, our house and Amanda's was a real heavily wooded so we actually had to be careful it was right around 5 o'clock when we got to, got to her house Rascal was in the lead with me dad and grandpa were following and Rascal and I went around the front dad and grandpa went around the back as I was following Rascal, he poked his head around the doggone corner of the house where Sally's bedroom was, bedroom window was. He immediately stopped. His mane bristled up, and he started growling. I stopped, and I waved Dad and Grandpa to stop, which they did. I clipped my Mini-14 off safety. Dad got their, already had their handguns out ready. I slowly walked up to Rascal, and Dad and Grandpa met us at the other side. And at the bedroom window on the ground were about four to six separate monster footprints. One set of these darn footprints is over 20 inches long and dang near six to eight inches wide. I mean, they do, man. Then I turned on my night scope and I started scanning the woods and I saw through my scope at least five sets of blood red eyes watching us. And I was thinking, uh oh, yeah, here's trouble. And I said to Rascal, Dad and Grandpa I said, guys, we're outnumbered. We got to go now. So we slowly backed out, of, backed away from Amanda's house with Rascal behind us this time to keep the Bigfoot from following us. And he was a uh, he was doing a couple of defensive circles around us. Now, when we got back to the house, it was about seven to eight eight o'clock when we got back to the house, and when we went through the front door, Rascal was the last one, and he locked the door. And as we locked the door, Rascal stood at that door to make sure nothing came through, and Grandpa and Dad said, told Amanda, like, why don't you stay with us for a few days? And Amanda and Sally did. That morning, me and Rascal, with my sister, went with Amanda 
and Sally to get some clothes and Sally's favorite toys. When we all came back, Rascal was playing with Sally all morning, and she took a nap laying against Rascal on the couch. Amanda told me that was the most relaxed little Sally has been for a whole week. And she was with Rascal all day long. Me and Dad and Grandpa started getting ready for these monkey men. And because we're, we're we were pretty sure they was going to head for our house sooner or later. Right. Looking for little Sally. I, I do not know. To this day, I don't know what them dang things wanted, wanted with Sally. I do not know. They wouldn't go near Amanda's bedroom at all. They, they were particular about Sally. Because she, Sally, uh, how can I say this? She was artistic. Okay. I don't know if they were attracted to that or what. Right. And once these type four Bigfoot found out that the man and Sally weren't at, weren't at their house, we, we knew that trouble was coming and we were right. That Monday night, <clears throat> we had the windows open and Rascal was laying beside me. In my recliner, Dad and Grandpa when it was in their easy chairs. The girls with the little Sally was watching TV. About 10 p.m., we started hearing hoots and the whoops from the direction of Amanda's house. That went on for about 40 minutes. Then we all went to bed. That Tuesday morning, Dad and Grandpa and Rascal went to check on Amanda's house, and I stayed with the girls. They came back and said there were big footprints in the front and backyards of Amanda's house. That Tuesday night, we heard the same whoops and hollers and all that, but, but it was closer with a large load of tree knocks. This time, Rascal made his rounds in the house all night long, checking on all of us. As we slept, he didn't sleep at all. Wednesday and Thursday, nothing nothing happened at all. But the woods all the way around our house was dead silent day and night. And we were all feeling kind of uneasy. I, I was feeling like we were being watched. Rascal kind of stayed real close to the girls. He has stayed especially close to little Sally. So me and dad and grandpa we took turns on watch we uh, tested our spotlights at the kitchen window to make sure they were working and everything then we turned in about 4 30 in the morning fell asleep then we got up about nine o'clock uh friday morning doing housework and all that and uh making sure the windows were okay on the outside and everything else. Now that Friday night, this started at 10 o'clock and lasted about two o'clock in the morning. We were hearing tree knocks all the way through the woods and they were much closer this time. My grandpa, every time he'd hear a knock, he would turn on the spotlights and the knocking would stop and we'd but we and we would hear running feet back into the deep woods. That Saturday morning I had Amanda and Sally move to my bedroom, which was the highest room next to the kitchen. Because the kitchen and my bedroom sat on top of the garage the basement with a heavy metal garage doors. The huge kitchen window had mounted spotlights on it and it stood about in the, the kitchen since my since our house was uh, built on a hill the kitchen 
and my kids, my bedroom window and the kitchen were about 16 foot off the ground because it's because both those rooms sat on top of the uh, garage. And the gr- all the girls, my girlfriend, Sally, my uh, sister and my stepmom, they stayed in the kitchen and in and my bedroom. Saturday mm-hmm. night was the worst night of the attack. The attack began about 10 to 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. starting out. At first, there were hoops and screams in our backyard for about 30 minutes or more. Me, Dad, and Grandpa got the girls in my bedroom and had them lock the door and get under the bed with Rascal guarding them. My grandpa put the metal razors on Rascal's claw hands and told him to guard the girls with his life. Me, Dad, and Grandpa went back into the kitchen, opened up them kitchen wind, opened up them huge kitchen bay door windows, and we turned the spotlights on. And when we did turn in spotlights on, there were five top four Bigfoots screaming, throwing rocks and limbs at the house. The huge alpha male Bigfoot was down below in the driveway looking up, looking up at us screaming. His back was up against the, uh, the 10 foot kitchen wall where I stacked winter firewood outside. This Bigfoot, he was anywhere from 8 to 10 feet tall, close to 7 to 800 pounds. He had four-fingered claw hands, and he had real dark reddish eyes. And he had mostly silverish black hair. Yeah, like, and so I'm guessing he was the older alpha. The next one up was in a maple tree right in front of the kitchen window. He was black with a reddish black eyes, about seven foot tall, maybe 600 pounds. He was up in a maple tree about 10 foot up. The other three were juveniles, light to dark brown hair, and they were behind the line of trees in our backyard. They looked, they looked about six foot, maybe four to 500 pounds each. We all immediately grabbed our guns, and I grabbed my Mini-14. Dad got his 16 auto shotgun. My grandfather got his double-barrel 12-gauge, and we had we started shooting through those open windows. I shot that 7-foot young Bigfoot that was up in the maple tree, and I blew his kneecap off because I, I was not able to get a headshot. He fell out of the tree, and as we were shooting, Rascal had slipped out of my bedroom window, and he snuck up along that ki- that ten foot kitchen wall behind the uh, eight to foot alpha male Bigfoot, who was preoccupied with us because we were shooting, well, we were shooting at his buddies, and he was just down there screaming at us. Rascal extended his claws and metal razors. We saw that, and he jumped on on that alpha Bigfoot's back and stabbed him through the neck twisting his head off, killing him. Now, blood and gore splattered all over the side of that house. And as Rascal was standing over that dead alpha, the younger one that I shot in a kneecap, he charged right at Rascal. And I don't know how he was able to run. I really don't. And Rascal leaped up 10 to 20 foot high. He slashed out with his claws and razors, decapitated this young Bigfoot that ran at him. And as Rascal took care of those two Bigfoot, my dad shot one of the juveniles in the head, killing it. Me and Grandpa, we kept the other two pinned down. And when the last juvenile was shot in the head, the other two that were pinned down, they managed to drag their dead companion back through the woods from where they came. 
and, and which ended the attack. And that was about one o'clock in the morning. And my grandpa and my girlfriend got Rascal back in the house. When uh, Rascal went up to the front door, they took him to the bathroom, sat him down in the uh, bathtub where they cleaned his wounds, washed him up real good, and sewed, sewed his left arm up because he was slashed there real bad. And that night, no one really got any sleep, but we all laid down next to Rascal who saved us. I mean, he he literally did. That morning, we all got up for breakfast. It was right across our uh, road. And we piled firewood, brush, and two barrels of old mortar oil. And we burned, we burned those things all day long with rascal garden over us. That night, we were all exhausted. That Sunday night, we were all exhausted. Yeah. And rascal... Rascal later that night was looking at the kitchen window, and I noticed Rascal's eyes got bright red. I quickly woke up Dad and Grandpa, and Grandpa says, oh, hell, here we go again. All of us looked out the window this time, and Grandpa turned on one of those spotlights, and this is how I know Bigfoot are nothing but cannibals, because they were at the burning pile, both of them, the two that got away. And they were eating what was left of the ash. And they were eating the the uh, the ash of the funeral fires. Or there was too big. They were even eating the bones. And then the very next morning, we tracked them last two Bigfoot with Rascal in the lead to the three ground caves in back of our homestead. At the entrance of them caves, I'm, I've never seen so many bones in my life. There were pig bones, there were horse bones, there were deer bones. There were bones of several dogs and cats. My grandpa told us to stay on that hill in front of the caves, and he went and got his tractor and three big old barrels of oil. And what he did, he had Rascal do a semi-circle all the way around and 200-yard defensive circle, make sure there are no Bigfoot outside the caves. And he wanted to make sure they were in the caves. So my grandfather pushed in barrels of oil and dumped those barrels of oil with a whole bunch of brush and everything else that they pushed up against those uh, mouth of those caves, and they set them caves on fire. Now, me, Rascal, with my girlfriend, we stood guard on the hill on the hill for our rifles ready. The fires burned all day. We never saw those remaining Bigfoot ever again because I think they escaped out of the out of the backs of one of those caves that were back uh, that were on the back side of the LBL. Okay. I mean, after that, little Sally and my girlfriend never never had any problems with these top four Bigfoot at their house ever again. Wow. Yeah. We're about an hour, almost an hour in, so we will probably uh, not go any further than that. Um, now, <clears throat> with the, uh, the attack on the house, was there property damage done to the homestead, or? Uh, there was a where they were throwing rocks and tree limbs. We yep. had two windows busted. And both windows, uh, both bedroom windows to my sister's uh, bedroom. Mm -hmm. And what would later become my girlfriend's bedroom. Because after that, uh, my girlfriend and little Sally came to stay with, live with us for a while, while uh, my girlfriend's mom decided, uh, since uh, her dad died and stuff, uh, her mom uh, 
bought the house from her girlfriend, well, from her daughter, and uh, moved in. Okay. Now, so how is the young the young girl after all this? Was she dealing well with it? I mean, did she talk about it afterward or? Little Sally? Yeah. A little bit after work, because she stayed, she kind of stayed lip, real tight lipped from, for uh, two or three months, because I know it affected her. Okay. But as long as she was with Rascal, she was just quite fine, like nothing happened. I'm thinking Rascal was her uh, security blanket, you might as well say. Yeah, right. And he looked after her without any issue, like he looked after you, kind of. Yeah. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. So we're, like I said, we're about an hour. I don't want to go any further. Um, Uh Because we kind of wanted to, you and I talked, we wanted to do it in increments where things weren't confusing. Um, So I guess we'll pick up at the point of after the uh, house attack, which I think would be 95? Nope, 92. 92. Okay, so we got a ways to go still. Oh, yeah, a long ways to go. Yeah. All right. Well, um, do me a favor. Don't hang up. I I'd, I'd uh-huh. want to talk to you for a few minutes after here. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say before we end the interview? Uh, these, uh, I want everybody to know, you know, uh, the razors that, uh, that my dad, that my grandfather made for Rascal. Yeah, Rascal, with those razors, and as strong as he was, virtually did make him invincible. Uh, and since we raised Rascal from a very, very small sick pup, I mean, that that has a lot to do with it, too. I mean, when, from my experience, when you raise someone as beautiful as Rascal with nothing but love and absolute respect, you know, that, that puts an impact on everything and everybody because you got love and I raised Rascal in love when I when I first got Rascal it, how can I say everything just virtually changed and Rascal was, I'd have to say Rascal was special. To me, he was more than a dog man. He was a member of my family. He was my best friend. He was my buddy. Yeah, he was my camping buddy. Yeah, he was my ultimate hunting dog. He, He was everything to me. That That's about all I can say. Right. I love him that much. And I still do. Yeah, it's I imagine it's hard to have a companion like that for so long and, you know, like you said, um not have him around anymore. Uh, yeah, that that really hurts. That's like Part of me is gone. Right. Right. Well, I do appreciate you reliving this with us all. Um, I thank you for, you know, coming on and sharing. And, you know. Oh, I loved it. One thing, um, I we had talked about it quickly and said, uh, 
you know, I I had said I was going to ask about photos, and um, you had expressed the simple fact that you know your dad and grandfather said, "Hey, uh, don't take any." For the reason, this is yeah. late '80s, early '90s, prior yeah. cell phone. If yeah. you wanted a photo developed, you had to go down to the drugstore, yeah. or you know, a variety, or you know, variety yeah. store, or wherever. And yeah. the people that developed them looked at your photos. Yeah, and your dad and grandfather did not want Rascal yeah. exposed well, to the outside. My dad's best friend. Who was his commanding officer really didn't want photos of Rascal. Right. Right. So I like I said, I, I would bring that up. I you know, you and I had talked about it prior anyway. Um but yeah. you know, it's so that hopefully will answer people's questions of why yeah. you know, you don't have a photo of Rascal because Back then, it was impossible, even if you wanted to. Yeah. It would have been impossible to take one without drawing attention to him. So. Uh huh. But, um, all right. Do me a favor. Don't hang up. I want to talk to you, like I said. And, yeah. Uh, thank you for coming back on and sharing some uh -huh. more with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Stay well, my friend. Okay. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed today's upload as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. Um, once again, it's a re-upload. Uh, I did say it in last night's second half, and there was still people asking that question. Um, so maybe if I say it in the intro and the outro, that question won't be asked. Um, why I'm sharing it again? Because there's so many new subscribers. And on Saturday night's live stream, a few of them asked about Rascal and wanted to hear more of what Robert had shared here because he was on another channel. And uh, you guys, the heart of this channel made him feel welcome. So he decided to share everything uh, on this channel. But with that, I'd like to thank you all for all of your support. Um, you are the foundation of this platform. I am truly blessed uh, to have such a base with me. Um, you guys really push me to the next level. So thank you. And please everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and God bless you all.